Hey you, you're listening to episode 158 of the Keto Diet Podcast, and today we're chatting about the signs that it's time to adjust your fitness goals, stages of your self-worth, inspiration versus shame, and really how to tell the difference, the practice that's best for your body, and so, so much more. I'm thrilled to be chatting with our guest today, Noelle Tarr, all about body image and fitness and really how to balance the two, because... I often talk about how much I respect and accept my body, and I think there's this misconception that if you love your body, then you don't have body goals, you don't have fitness goals, and I've always looked to Noelle as a great resource when it comes to balancing these both worlds, and she really introduced me to this whole concept of body positivity. So fast forward a bunch of years, and now she's on the show chatting with me about this, and oh my goodness, it was a dream come true. I've always really enjoyed her work, and I think you guys are going to really enjoy today's episode. The quality, I hope, is good for you guys today. I'm recording in some random, I guess they call it Verbo now, VRBO place here. And I made use with what I got. I got pillows all around me, and I hope today's quality is perfect. Now we're going to be chatting a bunch about body positivity and really steps to success when it comes to accepting your body. If you need more guidelines and you're just like, I do not get this, I need help. You can go to healthfulpursuit.com slash whole, that's W-H-O-L-E, and check that out. And if you have questions about today's content or you want to submit a question that I'll answer in a future episode of the Keto Diet Podcast, you can go to healthfulpursuit.com com slash contact and submit that. And also if you're looking for links and resources for today's episode, you can go to keto diet podcast.com. Look up for episode 158 and that's where you'll find all the links and resources and everything that I shared today. I got a couple cool things for you. And the first is that My book, Keto for Women, comes out like very, very soon. If you've already pre-ordered a copy, thank you. If you haven't already, you can go to ketoforwomen.com for details on how to pre-order. The best thing that you can do for yourself if you're thinking about getting a copy of Keto for Women is to pre-order it. That way you're guaranteed a copy. The pre-orders have been kind of iffy, so I'm not entirely sure if this book is going to show up everywhere I mean, I definitely have hopes that it will, but it never hurts to guarantee a copy. That way, if there are print issues or things just take a little bit longer that you're going to have a copy in your hands, you don't pay until June 18th and you lock in the lowest price that the book will be from now until then, at least when you order on Amazon. Plus, you're entered to win one of three VIP memberships into my 12-week video training program for women. Again, you can find out more details by going to ketoforwomen.com. Also, I put together a free resource that you guys can check out by going to healthfulpursuit.com slash sample that outlines different ways that you can work to lose weight on your ketogenic diet if everything that you've tried thus far has not worked at all. Again, that's healthfulpursuit.com slash sample. Okay, let's do this thing. Welcome to the Keto Diet Podcast, the show all about keto for women so you can burn fat, balance your hormones, and heal your body. If you're new around these parts, I'm Leanne Vogel. You may know me as the international best-selling author of The Keto Diet and author of the upcoming paperback book, Keto for Women, where I'm showing you how to take charge of the imbalances that are ruling your life so you can discover your happy weight in three easy steps. Or you may know me as the nutritionist that likes dipping pork rinds in avocado oil mayo. I'm so glad you're here with me today, and thanks so much for listening. Okay, so today's guest, as I mentioned, her name is Noelle Tarr, who's a nutritional therapy practitioner, an NSCA certified personal trainer, and the author of Coconuts and Kettlebells, one of my favorite cookbooks. In addition to managing the health and fitness blog, coconutsandkettlebells.com, she owns an online wellness practice specializing in an individualized approach to health and fitness. Noelle is the creator of Strong From Home, an online fitness program, as well as the co-host and producer of the incredibly entertaining Well-Fed Women podcast. 
She lives in Fairfax, Virginia with her husband, baby girl, Stella, and two boxer dogs. And while she was recording this, I believe that she told us she was also pregnant and may have had her baby already by the time this episode airs. So let's cut over to this interview. Hey, Noelle, how's it going? Hey, it's great. How are you? (laughs) I'm so good. I'm like, I'm so happy you're on the show because a lot of people don't know it and maybe you don't, but your podcast inspired me to start a podcast. I had never been interested in podcasting until I listened to your guys' show and I just loved it so much. I was like, I can do this too. I can totally do this. Yeah, you can. Yeah, I um I think it attracts a certain type of person. And so like when we, we have personalities like you and I who we like to talk and we like we like to, you know, I don't know, we're very verbal. I mean, I, I guess I do like writing, but I like talking a lot more. And when you hear other people do it, because I wasn't like you, I was inspired by other podcasters that I was listening to. And when you get into it and you start to record and you see the potential, it's like, oh my gosh, this is this is amazing. So I'm so glad that you started your podcast because clearly people want to listen. It's, it's very successful. Oh yeah. Oh geez. Well, thank you so much. And I'm so glad to have you here. The first question I want to ask you, because we're going to be talking a lot about body image um, and how that relates to our movement practice. I just wanted to set the tone and ask you, what does body image mean to you? Like what, when you think of body image, what, what does that mean for you? Yeah, I think it it encompasses a lot of things, but at its core, it's probably just how you feel in your personal relationship with your body um, and how you view it. And as you know, in our society, there is a lot of external or like, I would say external opinions about how we should feel about our bodies and how they, based on how they look or how they perform or, you know, your personal ability to control your body. And so unfortunately, a lot of people's body image is shaped by other people's opinions and what the world tells us that we should be thinking. But at its core, I mean, you get to decide how you feel about your body. And that's kind of, you know, my whole message and my whole passion, but um, you get to decide and it is entirely in your control. With, of course, work and stuff like that. I, I completely understand that some people really struggle. And I did. And I know you did. I struggled for a really long time feeling like I had to change my body or it needed to fit somebody else's standard of attractiveness or acceptable being acceptable or performing a specific amount and or performing a set um <laughs> a weight set or a, a 5k time or you know it's like i always defined myself by these numbers that i would compare to other people and especially in the fitness industry and um once i was able to drop that and kind of create a new narrative around that i I think my health flourished, you know, it was really interesting because I was doing all the things that people told me were healthy, but you know, it was so detrimental to my health. So back to today's episode in a sec. Today's episode is sponsored by my friends over at Perfect Keto, who is an awesome company that I've been working with over the last two years, and I love their commitment to quality, their ability to know what us keto people need because most of their staff are keto themselves. I use their products to stay into ketosis, burn more fat, extend my fast, and satisfy my sweet tooth. Now, if you're new to the ketogenic diet, Perfect Keto is a brand that you must know. All of their products help you get on the diet, make the transition easier, have you experiencing ketosis a little bit faster with boosted energy so that you really start to benefit from ketosis and you don't get discouraged by all of the symptoms that can pop up if you're not supplementing with electrolytes or not having enough fat or still having too many artificial sweeteners. And my favorite part to this, guys, is when you're new to keto, you can often have that afternoon slump by supplementing with some of their products, specifically their exogenous ketones or their keto collagen and even a little bit of their MCT oil powder. You can help avoid that afternoon slump that we can often experience as we are transitioning to the ketogenic diet. Now, my personal favorite Perfect Keto products include their keto bars, almond butter brownie, has my heart. It is the perfect dessert. Exogenous ketones help to maintain my energy level and give my brain a certain edge that I need every day. 
And lastly, their nut butter is out of this world. Amazing. Stick that stuff in the freezer, let it sit for 24 hours and go to town. I use their stuff on a daily basis, sometimes multiple times a day. And if you go to perfectketo.com slash KDP, you can get 20% off their products and up to 25% off, a total of $34 off when you grab my favorites as a bundle. Again, that's perfectketo.com slash KDP. Okay, back to today's episode. I struggled with the very, very same thing. And I can remember a certain period in my life, probably for about four years, that like those numbers were so important to me. Yeah. And nothing else mattered. And even if I was tired, I would have my smoothie and I would go, you know, run as hard as I could for whatever I had planned. And asking myself what I wanted or what I needed in that moment wasn't, wasn't part of that at all. No. Um, how do you know, what are some signs that it's time to maybe like look at this situation for women listening of maybe I don't need to, I don't want to say care so much because I think a lot of people think that if, if you, if you care about your body, that there's no, uh, how do I say this without stepping on people is <laughs> how do I, how do I care for my body and have goals and aspirations while also respecting movement and body image? I mean, it's a very, very heavy topic, but I think when women hear this, they're like, okay, so what you're telling me is I shouldn't care so much about numbers. I shouldn't care so much about these things. So I can just be lazy and sit on the couch and do nothing. Right. I don't think that people think that there's a gray area. I guess my question is, what are the signs that it's time to change yeah. <laughs> and that you should be listening to today's episode? <laughs> I think everybody should be listening to today's <laughs> episode. <laughs> um, if you're a female or you're a person, especially, I mean, men deal with this too. So I, and I had actually just mentioned this the other day, how crazy it is, how men are even struggle with body image. They're not as vocal about it, but they have their own ideas of what they should be and what they should be able to lift. And it's always kind of, at the root of their insecurity. So it's not just a female issue. Signs that it is time or you maybe need a change. I think that if food and tracking and your weight and getting on the scale and evaluating yourself by numbers is consuming your life, that's a really good sign for me personally. You know, and this isn't the same for everybody, but I had just gotten to a point where it was like, I was so unhappy, but I perceived that my unhappiness was coming from the fact that I couldn't achieve the numbers I wanted to achieve, whether that be fitness related or my weight, when in fact, it wasn't that at all, right? It was the fact that I was consumed by trying to achieve these numbers and thinking that my happiness lied in achieving a specific weight or finally being able to control my diet and not binge or finally being able to achieve the half marathon time that I wanted. And that, you know, happiness isn't a destination, right? And so if we have, when you have that destination mentality and you're really thinking and you're living your life to achieve some certain number, or some certain marker, and you think that, oh, if, if my life will change when I reach that, that's another sign because it shows an imbalance in your relationship with your body and your health and food overall. I think so many women go through life being so consumed by what they're eating and what, how much they've done in the gym. Right. And so a lot of women wrap their worth up into that. And when you step back and look at it and think, wow, I'm a person outside of all of this. Like my worth isn't dependent on my ability to control my food or to, you know, whatever max my back weight, my uh, body weights or <laughs> body weight, uh, backloaded squat. I call them backloaded squats, but in, I don't really, in strong from home, and you know this, I always call them body weight squats. I don't, we don't do any backloaded stuff, but um, like back, you know, whatever, max my deadlift, whatever the, the thing is for you, you know, that's, that's another sign. That's like, if that's what you define your worth by, like that's a problem, right? And so you are, you are a person outside of all of that and you there are other things that make you really, really awesome. And if it's, if it's starting to control your life and control your life in a way that you feel is pulling you outside of being able to do the things you really want to do. And I don't know if you ever felt this way, but I was like, I always looked at other people and I was like, wow, they get to do all these fun things. And, um, gosh, look at me. I have to like, 
do so much to maintain, like I have to get up in the morning and run to, you know, for two hours and like, gosh, it would be nice to like go out to a party or go hang out with friends at night or go to a restaurant and not have to like eat beforehand and just enjoy a meal. And I would kind of dream about that. Like, I wonder what it's like to be that, you know? And I thought like, for some reason, I thought it wasn't a choice. Like, <laughs> I just thought like I had to do this. And so that's, you know, all of those little things added up or like, okay, something's wrong here. Something's wrong with my relationship with my body, with something's wrong with my body image. That's what, you know, it is at its core. It's not the fact that you can't reach your, your goal weight. It is in fact that you are identifying yourself as somebody who needs to lose weight and that you can only be happy if you do lose weight. And that somehow, or, or you're only going to be like, I think interestingly enough, uh, a lot of people shift their focus to like, I'm doing this for health. And so it's like, well, I can't be healthy if, unless I'm 120 pounds or whatever. And so it's not even like, oh, I want to be this way because I look good. Or I look good at this weight. It turns into like, well, I'm doing the healthy thing, right? Like I'm, I want to be healthy. So I want to be at this weight. And it's, that's just false, right? You can be, you can be healthy at a variety of weights. So yeah, all those things. Sorry. I always ramble and I'm like, did I answer the question? I'm pretty yeah, sure totally I did. You did. All the <laughs> okay. time. You gave like 12 signs. So there yeah, you go. Okay. okay. <laughs> it wasn't um, a bulleted list, but <laughs> I'm so happy you mentioned health also, because, um, that was definitely through my transition of like learning about my body and what actually made me happy was realizing that I was using quote unquote health as an excuse to continue to push myself just as hard, but it wasn't about my weight anymore. It's because I wanted to be healthy, but there was nothing healthy about like having panic attacks in my pantry because I had eaten too much broccoli and didn't want my husband to see that I was like bawling my eyes out. Like that is not healthy. (laughs) Like that, that is not healthy. Now you, you touched on a little bit about defining your worth outside of these. How do you define your worth now? Like what, what do you use do yeah. you use anything to define your Yeah, work? absolutely. So just to give to set the stage, I mean, probably say like the time goes by so fast. I would say probably eight to 10 years ago now, you know, I felt like my day wasn't successful if I didn't work out. And I felt like if I had a workout plan set that if I were to take a day off, that it meant I failed in some way, right? The day was kind of just like messed up. And I, or if I didn't eat within the macronutrient ratio that I wanted to eat, then the day was kind of screwed up. And so then I would have to spend the next day making up for all that. Right. And so that's how I used to kind of evaluate my day. And this wasn't even that toxic of a mindset. I want people to know that even though Leanne and I struggled very deeply and probably on a deeper level than many people, like there's still a lot of these behaviors that people are doing every single day or, or, you know, engaging with every single day that aren't necessarily disordered eating or an an eating disorder, right? There are, there are behaviors that we all do every single day when we find our worth is wrapped up in, or when we think that we should be doing X, Y, and Z, whether it's CrossFit, whether it's, you know, doing a vegan diet or whatever, like the culture gives us these sort of like pinnacles of like, oh, this is the best. This is the thing you should be doing. And I do feel like in our culture right now, like if you talk to people, they think that doing a vegan diet is kind of like the healthiest thing you could do. You know, if you, if you kind of like talked, I don't want to say like talk to the general public, but everybody's like, oh, well she's vegan. So she's super healthy, you know, like that kind of stuff. Right. So not to say that, okay, whatever, but let's just say that. So like, if you're not being vegan, then you're like, you're a little bit lower on the scale in terms of your worth and your ability to be determined and like successful and all the things, right? Or you're a little bit lazy. And if you're not able to, you know, maintain CrossFit five days a week, then what you're doing isn't as good. You know, you're, you're just taking too many rest days, all that kind of stuff. So that's a very real thing, like in our society. And so many people operate with this like underlying, you know, belief. And so they kind of think that what they're doing, they always evaluate what they're doing based on what other people are doing or what society says to do, right? And so people have these behaviors constantly and they're always interacting with them. Today, my life looks (laughs) much different. And again, it took years and years to get through this and a lot of really interesting life experiences. One was I got really injured trying to maintain this lifestyle and I had to take a year and a half off. And so that really challenged my identity as a whole in being that fitness girl, you know, being the runner, being the triathlete. 
And I didn't have that anymore. And I had to figure out who I was without that. And that was really, really hard. And I kept chasing it and trying to get it back and trying to get it back. And I was like, why am I trying to get this back? This is clearly not right for me, right? Like even, why do I want this identity so bad? What is, what is so great about this identity? And is it t- really, is it really better to be a runner or to be a triathlete than if I just did walking and did like body weight stuff in my house? Like, you know, if that's what works for me. And I do have, I struggle with back injuries and I, um, a lot of it I feel unfortunately was something that came up because of how I trained <laughs> back in the day. Um, but I think a lot of it is structural. I've always had issues, right? So that all happened. And then I got married and became a mom. And I think that that's been a huge transition for me, which is now I don't see myself through the lens of like, it's a very selfless thing, right? To be a mom. And I think that it's been a very challenging experience. And even I still, even going through this experience, I've noticed how much I've, I kind of thought, well, I still need to do this three days a week and I need to be I didn't walk today. So, and I I just had to take a step back and say, what is going to be right for my body today? Like I just had a baby four months ago where people, you know, some that stage people are like, I should be getting my body back. I should be back to a normal weight. And so like, you know, a year ago I was sitting there thinking, wow, I just had a baby, you know, a few months ago, like is getting up and trying to work out right now really going to be the best for me? Like clearly I'm exhausted. Clearly I'm tired. Like, do I need to be adding more stress to my life? And the answer was no. Right. And so Really for me, I've personally find my identity in being a mom and being a really great wife and being somebody who gives back and gives back to people and serves others. And that's kind of what I want my legacy to be, right? Like I want to be a really great friend to people. I want to be a really great friend to my husband and a wife to my husband. I want to be a really great mom that's understanding and empathetic. I want to be empathetic to other people, right? I want to be looking for opportunities to serve and give back and be involved in my community and stepping up and helping when people need help. Ultimately too, I find my identity in God. Like I'm, I'm a Christian. And I think that that was a huge shift for me, realizing how much I was putting my worth in other things when really it should be rooted in Christ. And so that's, you know, it's at its core, it's very basic, but it really changes your life, right? I mean, cause sometimes you're so wrapped up in it and you don't even realize how wrapped up in it that you are. Right. I mean, and we're, we're kind of, I know this is publishing at different time, but we just got through some big holiday seasons and it's, it's crazy how much even that plays into, you know, when you go through a holiday, how much are you thinking about how much or how little you are eating and should you be, you know, burning off that pie that you ate and how hard are you, are you feeling guilty about the fact that you didn't work out on Thanksgiving? Are you feeling like, are you trying to jump back into it the next day, even though that doesn't really fit in your schedule and you're leaving your family that came in from out of town at your house? You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's really interesting. You, you see those behaviors when you have these big holidays that come up and, and family gatherings. And um, it's, it's really interesting to see all of that. And I really like the life that I have now. I will say that which I'm sure you can relate to this, but like, I'm in a place where I thought I was like, if, if I would have looked at myself 10 years ago, I would have been like, I can't, no. can't believe that's no. who I've become. <laughs> um, but I like, you know, everything I believed about who I am now was false and a facade, right? It was a, a false assumption based on what society was telling me, which is you can't miss a workout day and you need to be on a diet and you need to be counting calories and you shouldn't be quote unquote overweight or have extra weight, whatever that means. Like, I hate that. I'm like, what is extra weight? Like, are you kidding? We should, we should have extra weight. Like, that's a good thing. You know, like that's really important. We shouldn't be at our, like no extra weight. Like that makes no sense. So, you know, it's really interesting. The person I've become, I'm just so much happier. I'm so much less anxious. I'm so much healthier, healthier mentally, um, emotionally and physically. And I'm everything I didn't want to become. So back to today's episode in a sec. ButcherBox features 100% grass-fed and finished heritage-bred pork and organic free-range chicken. ButcherBox sends you high-quality, health-promoting meats directly to your door on dry ice and free shipping anywhere in the lower 48. ButcherBox makes committing to quality protein sources less expensive and more available to everyone. Their prices are hard to beat, and it's challenging to find a higher quality product anywhere in the USA. I've been using ButcherBox for years and love the convenience of a package showing up just when I need it, and their ground sausage is an absolute dream. 
ButcherBox has put together a super special deal for all listeners of the show. Order your first box and get a special gift plus an additional $20 off. Now, this special gift is so epic that I can't even mention it on the episode today. So you'll have to go to butcherbox.com slash keto diet to check out the deal plus get your $20 off your very first order. Again, that's butcherbox.com slash keto diet to check out the deal plus get $20 off your first order. If you're unsure of the link, simply check out today's show notes for all the details. Okay, back to today's episode. And that's so cool because none of the items of your self-worth had anything to do with your body. Right, right. Nothing to do with your body. Just about who you wanted to be, how you wanted to show up. And I think that shift is such a powerful one. And I agree with you. If I could, even five years, if, if I could see what I'm doing now, how I'm thinking now, five years ago, I'd be like, no, that's a different girl that just looks like me. There's no way... There is no way at all. I would, but see, I would feel anxious about it. And I would have even been like, I don't want to become that. I don't want to be that. You know what I mean? I would have been like, oh no, she let her wait. She, what's, what do people say all the time? Which is like, she, she let, let go? herself go. Yeah. yeah. She let herself go. Like, that's what I would be freaking out about. Like, oh gosh, she let go of all of that control where, you know, so it's just crazy to think about that. Yeah. <laughs> Totally. I agree. And in the beginning, you said, you know, dropping that belief of having to focus so much on your body. And we've chatted about um, self-worth. What are the steps that you took to become that person that you wanted to be that didn't focus on your body? And, and how did you, what were the first steps you took? Or were there steps? Or was it kind of just like a state of mind? Yeah, this is a really hard it question. And know, it's I'm something sorry. that I get, oh no, it's, it's fine. I get this question all the time and I try to give people really tangible things to do, but in, at its core, it's a different path for everybody. For me in particular, it was removing myself from all of the influences that I had really placed in my life. And whether that was on Pinterest, whether that was my subscription to like fitness and shape magazine, you know, shape magazine or whatever, whether that was the Facebook accounts or the Instagram accounts that I was following, I realized that what I was using for quote unquote inspiration was really just making me feel shame about what I was not right. Or what I needed to get rid of, i.e. cellulite or love handles or whatever. And so once I kind of saw that and took a step back, I think it was a lot of research and digging deep. And this was back in the day when you and I, we didn't like, we didn't have a lot of resources like there are now which are very body positive and, and stuff like that. But it just was like, I would scour and look for books. And I remember getting a book on emotional eating because I thought that was my issue. And then I was, I was like, well, if I could just knock out the emotional eating then. And so like that didn't work. And it was just like, then I remember finding a, like a belly flat diet book that was like, oh, well, it's not about counting calories. So this, this has got to be it. Like, so I just kept looking for these answers when in reality, the answer was to like, just take a step back and let go of it all. And I think after just kind of digging really deep and uh, like one thing that I always tell people is just keep asking yourself why, like, why are you doing the things that you do? So I, I would sit there and I would kind of think through it and be like, why am, but why am I doing this? Why am I so focused on counting my calories? Why am I so focused on like keeping the almond butter out of the house? Cause that was like one of the things that I would overeat on. Me too. Was, yeah. <laughs> It was like, it was, it was just no like, almond butter rule. <laughs> no, yeah, it was just like, don't bring it in here. And that's mostly because, you know, I spent so many years not eating fat, you know, doing low fat. And so it was just like one of those things that I just couldn't control myself around. So I was like, why am I so focused on like my weight? Why am I so focused on getting out to exercise? And the more I asked myself why and why and why, I got to a point where I found out that the root of it was I was trying to please a very small amount of people who think you need to have six pack abs or you need to look like a Maxim model to be attractive. And I had people in my life like that, like, you know, first boyfriends and stuff like that. And so it just stuck with me, right? It was just like things that I was pulling from my high school years. I had just taken with me as baggage. And I like built this whole belief system off of what society was telling me, but also like what other people in society were believing that were like important to me at one time. Now, not at all. Right. Like I realized these people, I was like, so trying hard to please because most people, including my husband don't care about six pack abs. Like they're like, I don't, what? like, I don't, you don't have to have that for me to love you and for you to be attractive. Right. It's just not a real thing. So like all the people that I loved in my life, 
and who loved me and like most of the actual good people in the world weren't like tearing me down because I didn't have a six pack, right? They were very loving and didn't care about my looks. And so I was really trying to dig deep and see, well, who am I trying to please then? Like if this, if it's making me miserable and the people in my life don't care about how much I ran today, then like, what, who am I doing this for? And that was a light bulb moment. That was like, Oh, I'm doing it for people who I don't even like, who I don't even care about, who I don't even share the same values as. And then I kind of just had to create a new narrative. And I will say I did get into, uh, I found paleo. I found, which, which helped me solely based on the fact that it was like eat fat again. So eating fat changed my brain, (laughs) so to speak. Do you know what I mean? Like I was an anxious mess before and then I was able to like think clearly even if it was still a a diet, right? To me, it was still sort of a a diet, but that was only really for the first year or two. But I was able to eat more. I was able to eat fat and I didn't see anything wrong with that. And I had been a vegetarian my entire life. So that really was like, whoa, have I been doing this all wrong? And it just kind of, you know, so like I felt like I had been challenged in many ways, which was like running's not the healthiest thing for you, for me in particular. You know, so I, was, I got into CrossFit and doing that kind of stuff. Like, you should probably be able to do a body weight squat. You know, like I couldn't even do that. And I no vegetarian wasn't really actually that healthy. And well, low fat vegetarian. Let's be clear, it was even worse. Um, and <laughs> so then when I, I I feel like a lot of those things were challenged, and I broke all those things down, those myths down, I was able to build a new conversation around food and fitness in my body, and I really got into this whole body positive movement, which was, oh, you can be a variety of weights and be healthy and you don't have to be a specific size. Like what, who says I have to be that? And I, and that is really, I think what the catalyst was. And of course it took a lot of work and a lot of emotional, you know, and and mental evaluation and work. But the more I surrounded myself with people who were, who had this message, the more I realized like everything I believed was wrong. And the more I got everything out that was toxic, the less I, it, it influence it had over me. So yeah. Beautiful. Completely. Okay. <laughs> I agree with you. It's okay. awesome. <laughs> I hope you're totally digging this episode. I love putting these together every week and I hope you're getting something out of it. I love seeing where you're listening from. So next time you're listening or even right now, take a picture of yourself watching the show or a screenshot of your favorite episode and tag me on Instagram at healthful pursuit. And if social isn't your thing, that's totally fine. Just jump on your favorite podcast player and leave a review for the show. Okay, back to the good stuff. Now, if somebody, if somebody's listening, let's take another angle. Um, if somebody's listening and they've never really had a good relationship with movement, maybe they just hate the gym. Like I am not going to the gym. I hate the gym. Every time I go, I feel like I'm being judged. I don't understand the machines. They just don't make me feel good. How can somebody have a positive relationship with movement? Like you mentioned walking before. Um, I think that there's a lot of pressure on us to move our bodies and it feels good to move our bodies in a way that feels good for us and everyone's a little bit different, but what do you say to the person that just hates going to the gym, but wants to move their body in a kind way? Yeah. I think the initial problem, and this is what so many of us have shifted to is we think that fitness is defined a very specific way, which is like you said, going to the gym and doing the machines. And that is largely based off of, I don't know, let's say the the seventies and the eighties when the gym fitness became really popular and, you know, gyms were created and it was these boxes where we all went and we moved and we did the exercise, but that is not how fitness is defined, right? There's, you can do a variety of things, just like you can eat a variety of foods and and you can be a variety of weights and be healthy. You can do a variety of things for movement and that's going to improve your health. Right. And so we're kind of in this, the fitness industry as a whole, there's a lot of people who aren't this way. But I will say the large majority of the conventional fitness industry does love to say, just like we talked about before, how most people think the vegan diet is the best diet and that's what you evaluate all your, you you know, what you're doing based off of. The fitness industry loves to say that, you know, intensity and, you know, really being hard and doing running or doing marathons or triathlons or doing CrossFit, like that's kind of your, that's what everybody should be doing in quotations for people who can't see that. That's what everybody should be doing. They should be doing the hard stuff, you know, and that's false, right? Because I know, I I think you and I know this, uh, a a lot of times those things can actually make you more injured and more sick and less healthy. And so I always encourage people to just 
remove their preconceived notions about what fitness is, stop listening to what everybody says you should do, and figure out like if no other external influences were involved, what would I do? What would I do? Would it be a combination of walking outside and working out in my garage? Would it be going to a, a, a fitness class at the gym that's maybe got some friends involved where I can do some like dancing and Zumba and a combination of a couple other things, or maybe it's swimming, you know, explore what that is for you. And it may take some experimentation because a lot of people are like, well, what if I don't like anything? That's okay. You know what I mean? Like you, you can still explore and find other things and you need to give it a little bit of time once you try something new, because you never know what you're going to be good at, right? Like everybody sucks their first day. Everybody sucks their first few weeks. We all do, right? Like CrossFit sucked for me for like two years. Probably, I mean, it still does. Let's be honest. But it's, you know, I, you don't really give, if, unless you give yourself time to get good at something and really enjoy it and get into the groove of it, you will never really know. So take a lot of those preconceived notions away do it in a way that works for you and fits into your schedule. Stop trying to make you fit into fitness and make fitness fit into your life. So if you only have 30 minutes to work out, then that's all you need to do, right? Or if you only have 20 minutes, you don't have to work out an hour a day, right? You don't have to be doing running an hour a day. You can be walking for 20 minutes and doing some yoga the next day and maybe lifting or doing some kettlebell work in your, in your garage, right? Like it's super simple. It's your, your health. What we really, the goal is, is to improve your health and to make sure that you feel better. Right. And so all of those things do that. And I do get it that there are better ways to move your body. So for example, I would much rather people do some sort of functional training that works the entire body and is load bearing in a way like walking is actually load bearing, right? Um, versus maybe sitting on a stationary bike at the gym. Like, I don't think that's very fun, but it also isn't really great body positioning. I'd rather you be doing some other things that are more functional, but if the bike's all you got and that was what you feel comfortable doing, that's fine. Right. Or if you just feel comfortable, your first thing that you want to do is get on the elliptical. Cause that's all you want to, that's like, what you feel comfortable doing, that's fine too, right? So I'm not saying like the gym is bad at all, but that's a great starting point for people too. So just remove all your, all your preconceived notions and create a new relationship with movement and make sure that it's one that serves you and your body. Beautifully said. And I also like um, that you talked a little bit about routine. I think a lot of us get caught up with, and this is like with anything, you know, the ketogenic diet of like, I'm keto. I eat high fat, low carb every day. I have my fatty coffee and then I have a lunch and then I have a dinner. There are no snacks, period. And even if they're hungry, they don't eat. Or, you know, I fast and I have 18 hour fast. Therefore, I fast every day, 18 hours. Doesn't matter if I'm hungry, I fast 18 hours. And same with movement. It's like, I'm a runner. I run every day. I run. I don't add biking to that. Why would I do that? But I think having that variety of trying different things and just moving your body in different ways, you're right. You never know what you'll find. And that's how my husband and I found sailing. I didn't, I didn't know anything about sailing and we tried it once. I'm like, whoa, this is so cool. And I'm moving my body and I'm in flow and it's a lot of work. And who knew it could be a movement practice in and of itself. But if I would have been so dead set on, I'm a runner, I'm a runner, I wouldn't have tried a different movement. So I think it, it's really important that you mention that because I think we get so stuck on those uh, labels, I guess, when it comes to our movement. So you're, you're very well versed in movement at home. You uh, were a lot of your videos, your workout videos are in our happy keto body program and people are loving them. And so can you chat a little bit about movement from home? Um, because you're like the specialist in that area. <laughs> <laughs> um, I try. Yeah. So I, I think that movement from home is such a great tool and it's an underused tool in terms of just the flexibility that it gives you. I think that I, I did a poll a few years ago, which was like, what is the number one reason? What's the number one thing that you struggle with when it comes to fitness? And everybody said time, time constraints, or just the motivation, right? It's a lot to like get up, put your clothes on, get in the car, drive to the gym, all the stuff. And so that is really where I created these like home workout programs from, which is how can we get this to fit into your schedule and how can we make this super easy on you? And especially for moms or people who are trying to juggle like multiple schedules, like this is brilliant. You know, you can do things from home and it doesn't have to be like 
going hard, you know, hundred percent of the time, it can be very restorative. It can be kettlebell work. It can be a high intensity workout and it can be like pretty short and you can get a lot done. Your fitness can improve with that. And so it really is about like with food quality intention and making it fit into your schedule. And the, the three tools, I call them four tools, but one of them is your body. So there you go. The four tools that I really encourage people to have is their body. So we do a lot of body weight stuff, a kettlebell, which If a lot of people don't know, it's like a little round ball with a handle on it. It's usually made of cast iron and you can do so many things with it. You can do lower body and upper body exercises and they're fun. Like it's just fun to play, like mess around with kettlebell and throw it around. Bands, which I think are so, like so underused. Bands are so important for overall like strength and you can get so much out of them without having to like lug heavy weights around. But for me in particular, like going through a a pregnancy where I had a lot of issues and then postpartum where it was just like, I didn't feel well. I went to the bands, you know, it wasn't, it was creating core strength and requiring a lot of me, but not actually loading a lot of weight, let's say on my, on my back or requiring me to hold a lot of weight in my, with my body. So with like, you know, my shoulder or whatever I could do overhead presses, but not have to load a lot of weight in my, in my hand. So that, and then the last one's dumbbells, which are just very versatile. And those are the four tools that I think, again, don't cost a lot. You can use and, and get a lot out of, like I have a lot of workouts that are just with bands. And then I have a lot of workouts that use all of those tools. And you can, by being very intentional and again, focusing on quality, which is doing a combination of some days doing restorative movement, but other days doing high intensity work where you're doing like 30 seconds of as many kettlebell swings as possible. And then taking 30 seconds off, like you're going to get a kick butt workout in from that. You're going to have fun. It's not going to be very long. And one of the cool things about like high intensity stuff is you do build aerobic and anaerobic path. You build your aerobic and anaerobic capacity, meaning when you walk, you're building your anaerobic health. But when you do this high intensity stuff, you're building both anaerobic, anaerobic, uh, you're building that capacity in, in, within your body. And so you're just making yourself healthy overall. I mean, it's not only good just for your overall health. I think it's good for your mental health too. So yeah, like that's your physical amazing. health. Yeah, yeah, totally. I agree. Well, well, thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing your story. I really, really appreciate it. Where can people find more from you? Yeah. So my website is coconutsandkettlebells.com. Most of the things are there. I just wrote a cookbook. It's called Coconuts and Kettlebells. Um, and it has a long tagline, which I won't bore you with. And then we do have a podcast. It's called um, the well Said Women Podcast. And we talk a lot about body image and our relationships with food and just, you know, having a completely different perspective on all of this health stuff. So that's really what we focus on. <laughs> Cool. Well, thanks again for coming on the show. I love your podcast. Listen to it every week. So keep on doing that. Um, And thank you again. Thanks, Leanne. Thanks for listening to the Keto Diet Podcast. Join us again in a couple of days to discover more Keto for Women secrets for your fat-fueled life. The Keto Diet Podcast, including show notes and links, provides information in respect to healthy living, recipes, nutrition, and diet, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Keto Diet Podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without any representations or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program. 